Movie props and pieces of memorabilia can transform what would normally be considered simple objects into becoming prized possessions among film fans and collectors alike. But while many valuable pieces from classic films of the past have been preserved, others have been destroyed or disregarded, while some fall somewhere in between, containing fascinating stories of discovery and controversial histories. On May 25, 1977, a little film called Star Wars was released into theaters. And while it grew to become one of the most popular and successful film franchises of all time, for a brief period it was just like any other movie, and during post-production, a considerable amount of its props were being stored at a local storage facility in Southern California. And shortly before the film's release, Fox Studios decided to end their lease with the facility, and with the exception of some items later retrieved by crew members, everything else was ordered to be thrown away and tossed into dumpsters. No! And while most of the props met that unfortunate fate, one item in particular was spared by the owner, the original model of the Death Star. That's no moon. Fast forward to 1988, in which Star Wars collector Todd Franklin visited an antique shop in Missouri, and noticed outside what appeared to be the iconic space station. And after speaking with the shop owners, who as it turned out had owned the storage facility in California, he was convinced it was the real deal. Despite an employee of Lucasfilm, upon his inquiry, insisting the original prop was destroyed during the film. Unfortunately, before he could scrap up enough cash to make the purchase, another buyer beat him to it, and for six years it was displayed in the lobby of a country western show called Star World. But with the business's closure in late 1996, Todd and his friends were able to purchase the prop from the owner, which at the time was being used as a trash can. And in 1999, the prop was then sold to Amazon executive and Star Wars enthusiast Gus Lopez, who would eventually loan the piece of movie history to the Seattle EM MP Museum, allowing others to view a true example of one man or studio's trash becoming another person's treasure. When most people hear the name Jaws, the mechanical shark from Steven Spielberg's career-launching film often comes to mind. Nicknamed Bruce after Spielberg's lawyer, the terrifying menace has become an icon of horror and theme park entertainment. When making the film, a total of three sharks were built, with each used for different angles and shot requirements. But it's no secret that the sharks rarely worked as intended, and was the primary cause for pushing the film's production behind schedule and over budget. So it should come as no surprise that once production wrapped, preserving the sharks were of little priority. It didn't really work all the time. It didn't work hardly at all. But with the film's massive critical and box office success, unbeknownst to many, a fourth and final shark made from the original mold was used as a photo op at Universal Studios Hollywood, which vanished without notice or trace in 1990. But in 2010, Jaws enthusiast Corey Turner received word that the shark was still in existence, and he was eventually able to locate the shark at Adlin Brothers Auto Wrecking, which was then authenticated by the original Jaws designer and mold creator. And upon the junkyard's closure in early 2016, the last surviving Bruce was donated to the Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Sciences, which will appear in their new museum when it debuts in 2019. In the early days of filmmaking, movie props were often discarded by studios without second thought, unable to foresee their future value. But thankfully, in the case of The Wizard of Oz, some of the film's most memorable objects were spared, which included the ruby slippers. Slippers. Yes. Yeah. All told, it is believed somewhere between 5 to 10 pairs were made for the film, and when production wrapped, at least four of them, including the original screen-tested pointed ruby pair, were placed into storage with one pair being given away in 1940 for a contest sponsored by MGM. The ruby slippers went untouched for over 30 years, until the studio hired costume worker Kent Warner, known now as a Robin Hood of sorts, for rescuing and selling historic film wardrobe which was otherwise thrown out, to assist in organizing a massive auction of film props and memorabilia. Rob? 
That's a naughty word. We never rob. And after digging through old MGM backlot property barns, he eventually discovered the famous ruby slippers. And the pair he turned over were sold for $15,000 to an anonymous buyer, who later donated them to the Smithsonian. But unknown to the studio, he actually discovered three additional pairs of ruby slippers, one of which he sold to a man named Michael Shaw, and the other test screen pair were sold to the late Debbie Reynolds for $300, who would later sell them for over $500,000. With the third pair, which are believed to be the slippers used for close-ups, he kept for himself, until his death in 1984, in which the Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Sciences, thanks to benefactors such as Leonardo DiCaprio and Steven Spielberg, acquired them for an estimated one to two million dollars. You see all this money? You see all this money? I have more. Look. But the final twist in the story comes with Michael Shaw's pair, as well on loan to the Judy Garland Museum at Grand Rapids, Minnesota in 2005, they were stolen in a smash and grab job. They're gone! The ruby slipper! And while some suspect it was an inside job or insurance scheme, due to the alarm and video security systems being conveniently offline at the time, town residents believe they were stolen by a group of drunk teenagers, who possibly tossed them into an old mining pit. I have to keep the shoes uh, in a bank vault. Regardless, despite years of investigation and search efforts, and there currently being a $1 million reward, they have yet to be recovered. So only time will tell whether these, or any other possible pairs in existence, will ever resurface. Warner Brothers' 1941 classic The Maltese Falcon is considered to be what launched the film noir genre into mainstream success. And much like the film's MacGuffin of the same name, the props used for the film share a similar theme of mystery and desire. Come closer. I want to talk to you. The story goes that while the official 45-pound lead Maltese Falcon prop had been lost for decades, the statue resurfaced in the 1980s, belonging to an oral surgeon named Gary Milan. But in 1994, a second nearly identical statue was discovered in the home of actor William Conrad upon his death. And yet another statue, which was made of resin and weighed around three pounds, was found in a flea market just a few years prior. Come, come, look, look here. All three statues have been authenticated, and upon examination, the two lead falcon statues bear specific details which match the falcon's appearance in the film, with the lightweight resin statue matching the prop used in promotional photographs, as evidenced by undergoing forensic analysis. But it's a Milan statue, which sold at an auction for $4.1 million in 2013, that has received the most attention, selling only behind the original Batmobile and Aston Martin used in Goldfinger. Holy Jack! That bird of prey loose among the golden geese. However, there's more to the story than what appears, because a man named Hank Rizon claims not only that the previously mentioned statues are fakes, but that he owns two plaster Maltese falcon props used in the film, of an alleged six maid as asserted in a 1983 memoir. And while they face the most skepticism, and have been dismissed by many as simple reproductions made for the 1975 satirical film The Black Bird, they have a surprising amount of evidence in their favor. It's a fake. In addition to the support of two past Warner Brothers prop department employees, as documented in a detailed 114-page authentication report, the props bear the initials of artist and sculptor Fred Sexton, a friend of director John Huston, who was hired to create the original Maltese Falcon props. Even the film's original script supervisor Meta Wilde, who personally authenticated Hank Rizon's statues, has made the claim that there were no lead statues used in the Maltese Falcon at all, only three made of plaster, and one made out of metal weighing roughly 15 to 18 pounds. And while further evidence and testimony is given, it also makes some big stretches, such as attributing the drastic differences in appearance to 1940s photographic techniques. As it now stands, the vast majority believe that the two lead falcons were in fact used in the film. And while many agree that a lighter weight statue was used in the last scene, speculation continues over which one. So for the time being, the real life mystery of the Maltese falcon props live on. If 1,000 years from now, archaeologists happen to dig beneath the sands of Guadalupe, I hope they will not rush into print with the amazing news that Egyptian civilization extended all the way to the Pacific coast. Those are the words taken from Cecil B. DeMille's autobiography regarding the set for the 1923 film The Ten Commandments. 
The production consisted of thousands of cast and crew, props, and animals, with the man-made city entrance being 120 feet high and 800 feet long, featuring 21 5-ton sphinxes in addition to lightweight versions and four 35-foot-tall statues of Pharaoh Ramses II, weighing around 40 tons each. But after filming was complete, while director Cecil B. DeMille was ordered under a county-issued permit to remove the entire set from the California sand dunes, with the film already being behind schedule and over budget, he instead decided to have only a portion of the set dismantled and transported back to Los Angeles, leaving the rest to be bulldozed and buried beneath the desert. And for nearly 60 years, the county and countless others had no idea about the buried city, until aspiring filmmaker Peter Brosnan, upon hearing of DeMille's quote, traveled to the Guadalupe Desert to see what, if anything, had survived. And what he discovered made headlines around the world. The wooden point of a spear, fragments of colossal statuary. It's being called the lost city of DeMille. But while an excavation of the site and filming for a feature-length documentary began with promise, due to funding and permanent issues, it struggled on and off over the years, before picking up again around 2010. Archaeologists uncover giant sphinx in California desert. As of now, work on recovering the fragile pieces of cinema history continues when funding permits, and various relics, props, and pieces of the set have been recovered and put on display at the Guadalupe Dune Center. But nobody knows just how much of the set from the Ten Commandments still lie beneath the sand, waiting to be uncovered. So what about you? If you could own any prop or piece of memorabilia from your favorite film, which would it be? As always, thank you guys and gals so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.